There is a lot of content in this next lecture, and that's because I've combined material from two different chapters because I don't want to overly emphasize geologic aspects of this course. It's geography after all, and those are the things that are most important to me. Here are the real world questions, and you'll note that there are a couple about some very specific Alaska things that you should be aware of. And in addition to that, there are, of course, a few other things. And um, in this section of the course, because not all the landscapes we talk about are in Alaska, we'll often pretend we're on vacation someplace and you have a question to address about some other part of the world. In this whole next section of the course, we are going to shift away from the atmosphere to so-called geomorphological systems. This will include a little bit of discussion of geology, first off, and then we'll talk about a range of things. We'll actually first, start up, um, first off talk about weathering and karst and mass wasting, and then we'll talk about river systems, oceans, and coastal systems, and finally glacial and periglacial landscapes. And a lot of those things, particularly the latter, um, have a lot of relevance to our regular everyday Alaska life. Before we get there, we need to just touch on geology a little tiny bit. The planet is structured with a solid metallic core, which is surrounded by a silica-based mantle. On top of that mantle, or at the very edge of that mantle, is something called the asthenosphere, which is a plastic-like material of sort of um, almost liquid rock that the crust that we live on essentially floats on top of. There are two types of crust, oceanic crust, which is relatively thin and dense, and continental crust, which is much thicker and not as dense. And um, they will be important when we talk about how they interact with one another. Again, we're not going to talk a lot about rocks and geology in this course, but you should know that there are a couple different kinds of rock. There are volcanic or igneous rocks. These include rocks that are extruded by volcanoes in an eruption. They form extrusive rocks. And then there are rocks that solidify under the ground because a volcano never erupts onto the surface called intrusive. And they're much denser and form some interesting landscapes that I'll touch on at the end of the lecture. Um, in addition to this, there are sedimentary rocks. This includes rocks that are made of bits and pieces of material, the so-called plastic sedimentary rocks. And then there's chemical sedimentary rock, which includes um, organic material that has been collected. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about karst later on. And then finally, um, there are metamorphic rocks that are formed when rocks of either of these other two types are put under pressure. The planet's crust is broken into a number of plates, hence the term plate tectonics, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with from basic science that you've had other places. Um, there are lots of these plates depending on how you define them and how you identify them. There's somewhere between 12 and 20 of them. They are composed of bits and pieces of oceanic crust and continental crust. Some have more or less than the other. Some are composed almost entirely of one or the other. And they move against one another. And as they do that, they do some pretty interesting things. Here's a map that shows the major plates, but there are lots of smaller plates and bits and pieces of plates that we can't see on this map. The key plate boundaries include the divergent ones, or the so-called spreading areas. These are constructive plate boundaries where two oceanic or continental zones spread or rift apart. Volcanoes erupt in these areas, creating new crustal material, hence their constructive plate boundaries. Subduction, on the other hand, is a convergent boundary that is destructive in nature. One plate plunges into and then usually under another one where it's destroyed in the mantle. The classic example of this takes place when an oceanic plate goes underneath a continental plate, but it happens in other places as well. These subduction zones form chains of volcanoes and have a great deal of deformation in the plates around them. The plates are crunching against each other, so they get all broken and warped and folded. All sorts of cool things happen to them. And the volcanoes in these areas 
tend to be very intense. This um, diagram right here shows spreading taking place in the Atlantic Ocean as the Americas pull away from <clears throat> the so-called Old World. And then on the other side, you have subduction taking place along the west coast of South America here. Another type of convergent plate no, boundary is an area of collision. This is called a passive plate boundary, but it's really not very passive. There are lots of earthquakes and lots of deformation taking place in these areas, but it occurs when two continental zones hit one another. Another type of boundary is a translation boundary. Again, a passive place margin that isn't very pa passive, but this takes place when you get lateral movement along the plates. So plates are moving next to each other. You also get deformation here, but it tends to be a lot more narrow. Um, that deformation in, in all cases produces mountains and earthquakes and all those sorts of interesting things. And we'll talk about some of the things that are created by deformation. The exception, uh, it's not really a, a plate boundary, but it's type of movement that's intriguing is what's called a hot spot where a column of magma rises up from the mantle. And as the plate passes over it, it produces volcanic chains. Hawaii is an excellent example of this. As the Pacific plate has passed over the Hawaii hotspot, it's created a string of volcanoes that actually goes back many, many millions of years. Most of the volcanoes are actually located under the ocean. We can't see them. But of course, the most active zone is on the big island of Hawaii, where we have volcanoes that are actively erupting where that hot spot emerges. Here's a map showing tectonic features of the entire planet. The green boundaries show areas of um, plate boundaries, either subduction or divergence or collision. And all the little red triangles show areas where we have volcanoes. The little yellow areas show hot spots. Obviously, the tectonic actions of the Earth's surface produce a lot of really interesting things. Crust is formed in a number of different ways, but at the very base of the crust are these very ancient rocks, which are referred to as cratons. Sometimes these cratons form relatively flattish areas that are covered with material on top of them that are sometimes referred to as shields um, or platform deposits on top of these. Crust gets built over time by number one, having material collect on top of this very ancient rock or through actions like subduction, which creates volcanic activity, but also causes terrains to be accreted. And an accreted terrain takes place when one area subducts another, the plate carries a bunch of stuff with it. And that essentially gets scraped off and dumped onto the continent. <clears throat> there are a number of examples of this. First is a map that just shows the broad shield areas around the world that have platform deposits and material built on top of them, which are sort of the ancient cratons of the planet. But this diagram right here shows how materials have been accreted onto the Americas. And you'll see that this is actually how our part of South Central Alaska is formed. The North American plate is over here. This is all shield material off to the east, but material has been collected on top of it over many millions of years. Some of this material is simply um, sedimentary rock that's been deposited over time and then folded and warped and faulted by tectonic activity. But some of it is material that has been accreted on and come from other places. And South Central Alaska is an excellent example of this. The Chugash Mountains and parts of the Wrangell Mountains in particular were carried by the Pacific Plate to its current position on the North American Plate. And as the Pacific Plate subducted under the North America Plate, all this material got deposited. It's a real mess, I should say, too, because it's not accreted in a nice, simple way. 
but it's all faulted and folded and deformed. And so we have lots of mountains in these areas, especially since the area is relatively young. Some of the things that happen whenever there's any kind of crustal deformation, whether we're accreting material or we're just engaged in regular tectonic activity, includes folding, the creation of basins and domes, the creation of faults or breaks on the crust, which include thrust faults and sideways transform faults. We're going to look at a couple of these things here in the next few slides. This shows folding. Um, folding takes place when rock literally gets bent in beautiful folds. And one of the best places that this takes place is in um, eastern United States, stretching from Pennsylvania down to Alabama, where you have these cool linear ridges that are all formed by folds. Basins and domes include features like the Black Hills of South Dakota, where you can see the geology has been bent upwards um, or downwards by tectonic activity. And then that's eroded later on, um, creating essentially rings of mountains. Faulting, especially simple faulting, can create really dramatic features like the Great Teton Mountains that have been thrust upwards. But the real thrusting takes place when a piece of material, crustal material, is actually thrust on top of another one. And this is called a thrust fault. And one of the best places to see the thrust fault is actually in South Central Alaska. Here is a map showing Anchorage right here in the Kenai Peninsula down here. And you'll see that there is a fault that goes in this sort of tongue form up into the Chugash Mountains. This is called the Eagle River Thrust Fault. And it's an area of faulting in which one part of the Chugash has essentially been thrown on top of the rest of the Chugash. And it forms some really dramatic mountains, particularly those that stretch sort of in between Eagle River and Lake Aklutna. And one of the questions asks you, how are the dramatic mountains of the Aklutna Traverse formed? And the answer is, through a thrust fault. Thrusting and faulting and all these tectonic activities we're talking about causes not only mountains and deformation, but also earthquakes as well. Plates are moving. Those plates build up tectonic pressure. The plates have um, friction as they push against one another because they're solid rock and they don't move very easily but the plates sort of inexorably push and push and push until eventually the amount of energy, tectonic energy, overcomes whatever zone of friction there is and an area ruptures and releases energy. That's what causes an earthquake. And of course, the size of the rupture zone and the amount of energy that's released directly relates to how strong the earthquake is. The ruptures themselves take place along faults at what are called epicenters. This is a map that shows the San Andreas Fault, one of the most famous transform faults in the world, um, where the Pacific Plate is moving laterally next to the North American Plate. It creates all sorts of deformation, creating coastal mountain ranges in Southern California but it also creates large earthquakes because the San Andreas Fault is always has tectonic pressure building up in it that gets released in various segments of it. And as it's released, it leads to large earthquakes all the way um, from Southern California through San Francisco. Earthquakes are measured in a bunch of different ways. The Mercalli scale tells us how intense the earthquake was. Did we feel movement? Were we frightened? Um, and there's a qualitative scale that's used to assess that. The Richter scale um, measures the amount of energy that's released instead. And that is expressed in a number. For every number you go up, you actually have 10 times the amount of energy being released. So many of you know that in 1964, an earthquake struck South Central Alaska that was depending on how it's measured, somewhere between 9.2 and 9.4 on the Richter scale. 
Um, not too long ago, there was an earthquake that was just over 7 on the Richter scale. The 1964 earthquake was a hundred times, over a hundred times stronger than that magnitude seven was. The amount of energy that's released in really large earthquakes dwarfs the much smaller earthquakes that we feel on an annual basis. And one of the things that's important to note about this is that it makes it pretty difficult for small earthquakes to release big earthquakes, the energy behind a big earthquake. So even though you might have lots and lots of earthquakes that are five or six on the Richter scale, they'll never release as much energy as you have with a really big one. So those really big earthquakes tend to be inevitable, especially in subduction zones like South Central Alaska. Now, a lot of that energy was released uh, over 50 years ago. And so we probably don't have to worry about another one taking place for another couple of decades, at least, um, but one could be in the offing at some point in the near future. Earthquake can be predicted in part by trying to measure energy release and see how that energy is transforming an area. Earthquakes are sometimes able to be predicted by um, looking where swarms of Earth, smaller earthquakes are taking place, though that can be quite unreliable. There's a whole field of earthquake prediction that looks at old earthquakes to try to figure out how regularly um, large earthquakes take place. That can help to predict earthquakes as well, and can help us to identify what are called seismic gaps, places that should have had an earthquake but haven't recently, they could be ready to have one. And then there are all sorts of sophisticated equipment that try to measure strain as well. Uh, by using very precise measurements to see whether or not mountains are being pushed up or down. Any way you cut it though, large quakes, especially in the red zone shown on this map, are relatively inevitable. It's just the way that it goes, and they're very hard to predict, um, other than making very broad statements like, in the next 20 years, there's an 80% likelihood of a magnitude 6.5 earthquake or higher taking place in an area, which might be good for planning a city, but isn't particularly good for planning what you're going to do during an earthquake. Now, moving away from earthquakes, let's talk a little bit more about volcanoes, which are, of course, a product of tectonic activity. They take place wherever you have subduction zones. They also take place in seafloor spreading centers and in continental rifting zones and also in hot spots as well. There are two basic types of volcanoes for our purposes in this class, effusive volcanoes and explosive ones. The effusive volcanoes tend to be, though they're not always, the ones that are associated with magma that's coming fairly directly from the mantle without it passing through a lot of rock and water. And so we tend to see these happening in hot spot areas and spreading areas. They produce what are called shield volcanoes because the lava that comes from them spreads out in a very liquid-like manner. It covers very large areas. In fact, sometimes so large it creates what are called flood basalts, which are big plains of lava. But when it does form a volcano, those volcanoes tend to look like a shield laying on the ground, very broad, and they can be quite high, but they're not nearly as steep as the explosive volcanoes. Explosive volcanoes tend to be associated with subduction. They include things called composite volcanoes, which are made up of all sorts of material, not just lava, but also ash, and what is called pyroclastic material that's created in a big explosive volcano. In a subduction zone, a lot of water gets pulled down into the subduction zone. That water becomes superheated. The rock around it um, starts to melt. As that moves its way to the surface, it tends to be very stiff. It's not lava like you see lava pouring out of a Hawaii volcano. Because of that, gases build up around that stiff rock as it moves its way to the surface. And those gases can be incredibly explosive and produce the really big eruptions that we're familiar with in Alaska in particular. 
if you look at these um, volcanoes in profile, you'll see how different they are. Uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii is this big, huge shield volcano. Um, Mount Rainier, which is, of course, a huge mountain, re is really dwarfed in comparison in terms of the volume of that mountain. It turns out that Mount Rainier has steeper slopes and is harder to climb than Ma Mauna Loa, um, but um, it is a very different kind of volcano. There are all sorts of interesting volcanic landforms um, that are associated particularly with the explosive volcanoes. The stratovolcanoes are composite cones I mentioned. There are also sometimes cinder cones created, which are small little mini eruption areas formed, mostly of pyroclastic material. Those can show up in flood basalts too. Um, and sometimes they're big craters. The really big craters are associated with explosive volcanoes that have erupted so much that sometimes whole volcanoes essentially are blown into the atmosphere and leave these really big, um, big calderas behind. Um, Mount Katmai is a good example of that. And then there's also rock that cools under the surface of the earth and then later on gets revealed by erosion. This includes rocks like um, or mountains like the Sierra Nevada, um, really dramatic um, features um, where you have these great big sort of rounded mountains like half dome um, that cooled under the surface of the earth or sometimes the necks of old volcanoes sticking up um, out of the surface of the earth, or long linear features called dikes that are created by these um, by volcanic eruptions um, under the surface of the earth. Here's an example of some of the features associated particularly with these composite cones. And then here is a diagram that shows us what these volcanoes um, look like, and especially some of the um, features that are created under the surface of the earth, like large um, granite batholiths and volcanic necks. And here's an example of Ship Rock in New Mexico, which is one of the most famous. So hopefully this lecture gave you a sense of the things that are really important in this class, and um, for this, this part of the class, rather. And I encourage you to dig a little bit deeper into this, looking at the text. The assignment this time around will ask you to use Google Earth to overlay a hazard map of earthquake hazard on top of Google Earth and then use the theory of plate tectonics to try to understand why hazards in an area are very high or very low. And as always, I'm happy to help you if you have any questions.